Hey, thank you very much. Uh, one thing about the title, I don't. Uh, I noticed in the uh, uh, in the t uh, title it says the GFDL hurricane model, the first regional dynamic model for operations. Well, that's not really true. Uh, we. <laughs> we, uh, because we had MFM with uh, uh, John Hovermail, who was very instrumental in the early operational uh, forecast of a, a dynamic models, and we had the QLM. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk about the evolution of the GFDL model. This is kind of a history lesson, so you'll have to bear with me here. If and it's it's kind of old, but uh, maybe we can er uh, learn a few things from this. Um, and my, uh, I'm, I'm giving the talk, but these other uh, people here were very instrumental in uh, bringing the GFDL model from um, a research model uh, to operations. Uh, Mars Bender and I were cohorts for a long time at GFDL, and we continue to collaborate. And Isaac Guinness uh, visited uh, with the ocean coupling and has contributed more than just ocean to ocean coupling and Tim Marchunk. Uh, Tim sort of took my place when I retired and I went to work as a contractor for uh, uh, EMC. Um, I think Tim got a better deal. <laughs> I had to get that knock. <laughs> okay, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, uh, Yoshi Kurahara, he was the architect of the GFDL hurricane model and also uh, the, uh, our group, the founder of the Hurricane Group at uh, GFDL. And here is it's a picture of uh, Curry at his retirement with Joe Smagorinsky. And these were the good old days in the 70s where uh, GFDL did uh, modeling of, on uh, all scales from, from global right down to cloud scale. So we were doing modeling uh, as I mentioned, for all scales, and I think we were uh, pretty successful. Uh, okay, here's the the uh, chronology, uh, the chronology of the hurricane modeling at GFDL, and we had a long period where we were basically research model. We established the the hurricane project got started in 1970, and I, I came about that time, and Curry and I started working. And uh, we progressed for m many years. We started to work on the movable mesh model and uh, then uh, started to develop this model. Had to be, if we were going to use it for operations, it had to be more than just a model. It had to be a prediction system. I'll talk a little bit more than that. So it wasn't, we actually started to run uh, real data hurry cane forecast uh, as far as uh, hurricanes in the um, in, uh, in the uh, eight, uh, 90s, right in the, in the 90s, but we didn't really become official. The, the GFDL hurricane system didn't really r start running officially until 1995 at um, uh, uh, EMC or NSEP, and then the Navy uh, used our system the next year. And so we, uh, our work continues, or the work of the GFDL continues, and also we, the, recently we were doing, recently I mean in the last decade, doing upgrades to the model, and as you probably, some of you probably know, uh, climate studies, hurricanes and climate, were also studied by this model. Uh, here's an old picture of the box model uh, developed by Kurahara and uh, Holloway, paper 1967. And believe it or not, this same box structure, A grid, is still used in the GFDL hurricane model. And uh, maybe the sole surviving A grid model. And you might ask, well, how can that survive when it's competing against these fourth, fifth order schemes? Uh, one thing is, is I think it was brought up, I think, uh, by Lou. It, it, you have to be very careful, too, when you're coding things up. And uh, I think uh, Kurahara led the way in being very careful and precise. And so this A-grid model uh, 
seems to be, even today, seems to be competitive. Here's a, here's a picture of our group circa 1990. Um, this is Becky Ross, who had helped with the Vortex uh, specification code. Uh, and this is Morris and me and Curry. Early 3D model. This, uh, this was the model which I, uh, Curry and I worked on. And this looks kind of remarkably like uh, what Rick Anthe showed. Because uh, uh, he was basically our competitor in those days. HRD was doing some modeling, and so were we. And uh, this, we called it a hurricane in a box because we had wheels, or uh, walls, not wheels. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting thing is, uh, uh, I was listening to uh, 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 George Bryan's talk today, and he had this kind of stretched grid where you had fine resolution in the interior, it was a Cartesian grid. This is identical to what we used, as far as I can tell. So we had fine resolution in the, in, in the center, and it was uh, stretched as one went out. But yet it was still rectilinear. Uh, OK, early works. We did Genesis work way back in the 80s. And uh, uh, this was kind of fun. We developed a. Uh, a storm from a wave, and uh, we saw that this effect of shear was critical. That if we, it was, if it was strong shear, um, it would uh, uh, the storm would not develop. In fact, the first real data forecast by the hurry, by the GFDL group was actually on a Genesis case. This was before we started to use. We well, were still developing the nested grid, but this was in the Figgy year, 1980. All right, uh, seven, 79. 79. Yeah, David. So anyway, uh, there was some, uh, they, some way questioned the validity of uh, some, the scientific uh, validity of this, and since we used a, a convective parameterization, but it's still a start, and it's uh, kind of encouraging to uh, read the papers about follow-ups to this on uh, Genesis uh, uh, simulation uh, uh, 30 years later. And here's the nested grid system, uh, which is clearly is, and I'm bragging a little bit, but mainly on Curry's part, uh, for Curry's part. It's an impressive scientific tool, because by using this grid system, here this is shows what uh, three, three grids in fact, we are using this. Uh, the operational system today still uses this same framework. It's just it's doubled the resolution. Instead of one one third and one sixth, we now have uh, one half, one sixth, and one twelfth. And this runs very efficiently. And there, it was kind of a, a computational exercise to get this. I mean, we started run, we started developing this tool. Uh, way back when, when we didn't have a distributed memory machine, so we had to convert this uh, at one time. A funny story about this, I'll bring this up, uh, Lou's in the audience. Uh, that, uh, we're, we were developing this for operations, and, and we had to get this ready for a distributed memory, and uh, some people at NCEO were a little getting nervous because we, were, you know, we didn't meet their deadlines. And in fact, uh, somebody who, I don't think I really remember who did, did but uh, somebody from NCEP called up GFDL and they said, we're disappointed in the GFDL hurricane group. He says, we hear they're doing research. <laughs> and it worked. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Something happened. what I do? I did research. <laughs> now. Okay, we've lost the. I didn't touch a thing. Following on this up? I was telling the story. I shouldn't have told that. It's on here. Yeah. Oops. Is Cindy over there? Help, Cindy. I pushed the button. I shouldn't. That's all the connection. Okay. Open 
one second, please. It's not this guy. No, it's not even got a light on. That's bad. It's on. You have to clean up your presentation. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not on the Mac. I'm no, no. Something is, something is. So if we just unplug it and plug it directly in the back of here. Yeah, I think so. Okay, I'll, I'll get back to my talk and stop uh, complaining about <laughs> phone calls. Uh, one thing is the principle of, the, of this mesh design in the GFDL model, uh, the separation of the mesh and the dynamic interfaces, and uh, this mesh system and the nest design is actually quite a bit different than, uh, than other um, nested grids. In fact, the, um, uh, these, these grids are only coupled at the boundary, at the mesh interfaces. And there's no, so the, the feed, or another way of putting it is the feedback is, is only at the boundary, not, not in the, in the uh, apparent, uh, throughout the parent grid. And here's an example of uh, uh, how powerful this system is. Um, and this is uh, provided by Isaac Guinness. We have this pulse here, and we have two simulations. One, the, and this is using the GFDL nested grid shallow water equations in this case. And you see how well it just carries along the system. Following the system, and also letting it to just go through a, a stationary mesh. So the, this has been, this is a very, and we get very uh, little noise running the GFDL nesting uh, system. Okay, some other things that we've done in the past is uh, we've studied this uh, impacts on and by uh, tropical cyclones. Here's a case which uh, we did where we showed the influence of, uh, of Taiwan and showing how, and this is idealized case where the storm, we had a control without the uh, topography here and that just went right on through and the influence on the topography uh, having the storm move around the, the topography. Here was another case where we actually, uh, with Becky Ross and Curry, where they actually took the storm out and showed that the storm itself had an influence we ran two cases, with and without the storm, and had an influence of the coastal front. Here's our group um, several years later, and uh, as I mentioned, our group, we, we really uh, benefited from having Isaac Guinness there and C, uh, Chin Che Wu in addition. Uh, and there were some other visitors as well. David Nolan was there for a while. Um, uh, here's uh, ocean coupling, and uh, Isaac came and worked first in idealized uh, world, and we sh and I think some of this was showed before, where the influence of the ocean uh, on back to the hurricane, and that was of course uh, depended on the intensity, depended on the on the propagation of the storm. Other research which was done, and I'll let you read this. We did a lot of things on a time difference, it seemed, lateral boundaries, convective adjustments, idealized ver uh, and model spiral band analysis, vortex specification, and uh, as I mentioned, hurricane eyes and landfall, which I sort of, I kind of liked landfall simulations, and also hurricanes and climate. So when we became operational, this was the, the first year, uh, 1995, and one thing to mention is, is where this is more than uh, just a model. You need uh, you, you need to set a whole system. How do you set the initial condition up? Because the uh, the hurricane center would like the initial uh, storm size, structure, and intensity to be uh, the, to be accurate, and this this is still a, a big issue today. And how do you do that? And uh, so we, we had this scheme, and then you ne also needed, after the model runs, you need to some way to uh, look at the result. Uh, and this was the first kind of year, 1995 was the first year we ran the GFDL model, and uh, we did very well the first year, 95, where other models were 
up, uh, were actually clear, clearly uh, uh, inferior. But this didn't really last very long. And I think Jim Gerst brought up a uh, good point is this was right about the time when the global models were actually getting their, their uh, uh, vortex specification uh, and synthetic vort uh, vortex put in the global models. So this is about the same time. So both of them were made, in, both systems improved. Uh, some trend, uh, keys to success is, uh, frankly, you know, our transition to operations is going to be nothing like anyone later on. And that we, we would, it was only a couple people involved. And uh, basically, we had Lord and Mom and ga gave our group a lot of uh, leadway, just do your thing. And to my knowledge, there was only one memorandum of understanding. There were no committees, workshop, reports, test beds. So we, and we uh, just went ahead and did it. And uh, one thing you need to know here is that our group, it's, we, we had the, the ability and the desire to apply these re our, our research results to a practical application of NWP. And a lot of that work is dirty work, let's be frank. And this is, uh, some people paid the price more than others. And here I'll let you read them. And uh, as you can see, uh, progress was made. It's from 95 to th 2004 in the uh, track forecast. This is the GFDL. And you see the global model, this is GFS. And they gradually improved. To, and so it's very competitive now if not, uh, in track to us. And, uh, we improved because both we made improvements to the model and also the, the GFS forecast analysis system was getting better. I won't bore you with the res I'll uh, Basically, we were making a stream of constant improvements from 98 to 2006. Uh, and that included more than just resolution. It also included uh, making changes to the ocean coupling. Um, and changing physics. And uh, this was from our paper in 2007 for the track forecast, averaged over, this was over a thousand cases from 2003 to six. And the GFDL, uh, especially at the short uh, two day range, was, uh, d did, did well compared to the other uh, track models. We haven't given up in intensity. Uh, here's a case where it seems as though when we made some physics improvement, this is a, a three-day forecast error, and we're getting dro we got drops, which appeared to be coincident with the in implementation of GFS, phys or, yeah, GFS physics or NSEP physics, and also microphysics. When we put that in, we seem to get an improvement. And there's, uh, th th this type of graph can be a little misleading because there is a lot of noise. Even this year, by this metric, uh, the GFDL, ha at, at least at three days, had a pretty good intensity forecast. You wouldn't know it by all the, the discussion. And this, like I said, it may be a bit misleading. Okay, where do we go from here? Well, we have, I'll let you, maybe I should say, where do you go from here? I, <laughs> I, I'm actually thinking more of grandkids than anything else. But anyway, a transition to uh, HWARF, this is still an ongoing thing. And it's, in, it's been kind of uh, exciting for me in many ways. I've been able to work both with GFDL and now with H4, uh, HWARF. The impact of HFIP, we're doing lots of, we're doing lots of forecasts. So this, uh, and people are interested in the problem. It's just not two or three people anymore uh, are uh, trying it models. And we got model upgrades, big issues, in impact of assimilating more storm data. This is not a, not a simple matter. Uh, EMC is starting to do this now uh, uh, at the, with the weekly HFIP or uh, uh, HWARF meetings. There's been talks on this. Big issue is deterministic versus pro uh, probabilistic intensity. And in my opinion, so far, it appears that this consensus dynamic models and the statistical models, they seem to be where the improvement is showing so forth, if it is improved. 
Also, global models are getting very fine resolution, so how much longer are we going to need the regional model for operational forecast? So I think I'll...